1862, an English physician by the name of Thomas Orton was facing a heart-wrenching medical mystery. A family of six had lost three children to an unidentified illness, and now the fourth child, Anne Amelia Turner, had fallen ill. The deaths of the previous children had been blamed on diphtheria, but none of the neighbors reported having the highly contagious illness, despite living in close quarters with the Turner family. Moreover, the sick children had not responded to traditional diphtheria treatment methods. Dr. Orton was one of the most senior physicians in London, and he had no doubt seen his share of peculiar medical cases. However, this particular case would need the help of a chemist to re-examine an unsettling theory about a shade of color used in everything from wallpaper to clothing. Colors have always been a tool for signifying status, conveying messages, and channeling self-expression in many cultures throughout the world. In the 21st century, we live in an age where most people have access to all the colors of the rainbow and more. But at one time, not all pigments were accessible. Some were not as easily created as others, and some colors found in the natural world had to be replicated by synthetic means in order to be used in a consumable way. The production of dye was complicated, and in the early days of the process, dyes would wash out or fade quickly. The colors were often muted and dull, and it was difficult to produce colors that were consistently bright. As time progressed, the process improved, but there still were certain colors that were more labor-intensive to produce, making them more expensive. This explains the naming of certain shades, like royal blue a deep and vivid blue that was only affordable for royalty. By the 1500s, dye trading had become a booming transcontinental industry. Many dyers in Europe worked around the clock to create unique, never before seen shades for wealthy consumers to buy up and kickstart fashion trends. Despite its abundance in plants, Green was one of the pigments that was scarce and difficult to produce for commercial use. For a while, merchants and artists struggled to find ways to make this pigment show brightly. Leonardo da Vinci was known to complain about the fact that natural green paint would fade quickly if he didn't apply varnish to it. It wasn't until 1775 that a new artificial bright green pigment was synthesized. A Swedish pharmaceutical chemist named Carl Willem Scheele is credited with the discovery after conducting experiments on arsenic, creating a dark green out of copper arsenate. Soon after Scheele's green was commercially developed, some variations on the color were created, including Paris green, or Schweinfurt green, and emerald green. Over time, these variations began to make their way into fabrics and paints around the world and they all contained high levels of poison. By the 19th century, those in the scientific and medical communities had some understanding of the threat arsenic posed to the public. In the United Kingdom, the House of Lords attempted to pass a law in 1851 that forbade women from buying arsenic after multiple cases of wives poisoning their husbands came to light. In fact, through much of the 19th century, one-third of all criminal cases of poison involved arsenic. Despite this, many doctors remained skeptical on exactly how poisonous the chemical was. It was difficult to get a full picture of the effect for several reasons, including the fact that many of the symptoms of arsenic poisoning mimicked that of other illnesses. This made it a viable option as a poison. It could be administered over several days and had a gradual effect that slowly declined the victim's health. While some cases of poisoning were eventually uncovered, it's likely that many were misdiagnosed. Furthermore, the impact of arsenic poisoning was usually only visible on the most vulnerable members of the population, including the elderly, children, and immunocompromised people. However, these populations were also vulnerable to the many illnesses that were present during this time. And ultimately, 
doctors would more often place the blame on sickness from pathogens rather than poison. A doctor could have two patients with the same green wallpaper laced with arsenic, with one falling ill and the other remaining healthy. In situations like this, it's understandable why medical professionals wouldn't think to consider the green wallpaper as a reason for their patient's illness. This lack of understanding, along with the vogue of these deadly shades of green, allowed the poison to quietly enter shopping centers, stores, and homes, slowly killing their oblivious occupants over time. In the 1860s and 1870s, bright green arsenic hues were considered highly fashionable for both clothing and home decor. But besides wallpapers and waistcoats, Arsenic was a common part of everyday life for many households in the Western world. Small amounts of arsenic could be found in beauty products such as arsenic complexion wafers that promised Victorian women milky white skin. In Austria, a brand of libido pill used a dose of arsenic as one of the ingredients. White arsenic, or arsenic trioxide, was even prescribed in small doses by doctors to treat ailments as serious as typhus along with common ailments like menstrual cramps. Arsenic could be found in food products like candy coating and food coloring, and small amounts were sometimes used as a bulking agent in flour or sugar. Meat and vegetables were sprayed with an arsenic-based pesticide to keep flies from landing on the food as it was transported from the market to the kitchen. The green ink on lickable stamps would leach arsenic onto unsuspecting tongues and the artificial wreaths women wore in their hair sported the same trendy green. Unfortunately, even baby carriages would sometimes feature this fashionable but dangerous color. For most healthy individuals that come in contact with arsenic in clothes, wearing a green dress might cause a rash, irritation, or an occasional oozing sore. However, as arsenic's popularity grew, it began posing more of a problem for healthy people, mainly textile and factory workers, that were in constant contact with the poison for hours a day. Workers in wallpaper factories were hit the hardest. The flock papers used to make the wallpaper had small fibrous particles that formed a fine dust. The grueling manufacturing process would kick up a lot of dust, which stuck to the skin, eyes, and lungs of the workers. Any cuts or abrasions on the worker's skin was also an opportunity for the arsenic to make its way directly into the bloodstream. Just one year before the Turner children fell ill, a 19-year-old London factory worker named Matilda Scheuer began to feel sick. Her factory job involved her dusting artificial leaves with a green arsenic powder, and she spent much of her workday inhaling the chemical. At one point, she told her doctor that everything she looked at was green. The whites of her eyes turned green and she began vomiting up green fluid. When she died, her death was highly publicized and an autopsy revealed that arsenic was found in several of her internal organs. It was midway through the 19th century and many doctors had already begun to question whether arsenic was really as benign as society was currently treating it. Matilda's death raised yet another red flag concerning the safety of arsenic products. A year later, Anne Amelia was fighting the same battle that had taken the lives of her siblings and Matilda. Dr. Orton had not yet made the connection, but he was beginning to realize that the diphtheria diagnosis was likely incorrect. He began doing more research into the family's living conditions, which he found to be cramped but clean and in capital condition, well-drained and ventilated. He took notes on the sanitation and water supply of the Turner's neighborhood, but found nothing that was considered a health hazard. When examining the Turner's bedroom, however, he did notice one detail that gave him pause, the bright green wallpaper. He remembered a theory that had been circulating around the medical world, positing that this particular arsenic green wallpaper was deadly to consumers. Even with this idea, he was still at a loss on how to heal Anne Amelia's sickness, and tragically, 
she too lost her battle within a month of being in Dr. Orton's care. Determined not to let Anne Amelia's death be in vain, he called for an inquest and applied for permission to perform a post-mortem examination, hoping to find more evidence to back up the theory. A renowned chemist known as Dr. Lathibi was brought on to test tissue samples from Anne Amelia's body. After running tests on the samples, he confirmed the cause of death to be arsenical poisoning, solidifying the long-debated theory that arsenic was indeed deadly, even in small doses. Newspapers set off a firestorm of articles detailing the tragic death of the Turner children and their untimely poisoning by the bedroom wallpaper. Dr. Lathibi got somewhat caught up in the sensationalism, saying, I have known two children die from arsenical poisoning, imbibed while playing for a few hours daily in their father's library, insinuating that the children could fall ill quickly. Despite the evidence of real danger, it wasn't enough to satisfy the judge during the inquest. He questioned the theory as objectionable, and perhaps weary of the sensationalism the situation was attracting, the jury ruled Anne Amelia's death to be of natural causes. This ruling caused a lot of frustration, especially among court reporters, one newspaper labeling jurors as a perverse jury. Despite this setback, the tide against arsenic was beginning to turn. Newspapers began to report more stories of arsenic poisoning, and the public was paying more attention. Another tragic case took place in the United States at a Boston orphanage. As the nurses cradled the orphans, arsenic from their dyed uniforms would rub off onto them, and they would breathe in the fibers, leading to the illnesses and death of several babies. Even with these tragedies, the dangers were still largely ignored at first. William Morris, founder of the Morris & Company Wallpaper Manufacturing Company, outright denied the effect of arsenic. Having worked with arsenical paints and used wallpaper in his own home, he believed that since he hadn't personally been poisoned by the products, it couldn't really be dangerous. However, more and more of the public saw how arsenic was affecting both vulnerable and healthy populations, and Morris was hit with criticism. Morris and company eventually rolled out an arsenic-free line of wallpaper during the 1870s. Over time, more measures were put in place to limit the use of arsenic in food and beauty products, and at the start of the 20th century, arsenic green had fallen out of fashion. While no legislation was ever passed to prohibit the use of arsenic in colored wallpaper in Britain, consumers all around the world have only become more conscious of what sort of ingredients and chemicals are used in different products, especially in the new millennia. While this awareness has pushed some companies to be more transparent, the historical use of arsenic in household goods is a reminder to consumers to be wary of ingredients that have not been adequately tested.